Scotty Barnhart, how are you doing? I'm good, man. How are you doing, Sean? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. Good, man. Um, how's your family and everything? Well, I guess, unfortunately, I got the news today that my, my mother has, has the, the virus. And I, just, mm -hmm. I did, just found out not too long ago, so I'm still processing that, and my family's still processing it. But she's been in a, she's been in a nursing home since September, and, you know, we haven't been able to see her in a few months. So, you know, it was really almost not surprising that this happened, but, uh, you know, the way things are. But otherwise, you know, like most of the families, it's trying to, trying to do what we can do day to day. And most of my family is in Atlanta. That's so why I'm born and raised. So my brother and sister and my dad, my mom, everybody's there. And I'm here in Tallahassee. So, uh, you know, just trying to do the best we can now. So I was trying to think of, uh, well, I, I know very clearly when we met, I just, the, uh, the the year I'm not crystal clear on. So it would have been about maybe three years ago okay. in Cleveland. Oh yeah, that's right. You joined us at night town, I think. Yeah. That's right, that's right. Okay. That's right, man. Came in smoking. <laughs> yeah, man. Um, you know, uh I have buddies uh that are in the band and, mm -hmm. you know, uh and that I've, you know, been buddies with for a long time and of mm -hmm. course they always spoke highly of the band and mm -hmm. um you know there's nothing like you know the way that you know basie plays the blues you mm -hmm. know exactly right. exactly you right. know and uh and of course you know i'm i'm uh i'm about the history and the tradition mm -hmm. of, of our music mm -hmm. and so of course i've listened to a lot of recordings and mm -hmm. seen live footage and all of that kind of thing mm -hmm. and uh but until you sit in the chair, yeah, <laughs> it's a different thing, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's a it it really yeah. is. I've had it a lot really of is. Summer, it's a different thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, my my experience uh, playing with you then, and and then the couple tours I've done with the band has been a, a highlight uh, in my career, Thank and I uh, appreciate the opportunity to play yeah. with y'all. Hey, well, our pleasure to have you with us, man. You're an incredible musician, man. So, you know, it's, uh, I'm sure we'll see you again. You know, since <laughs> last time, that, uh, the last two you did with us. So I'm sure we'll see you again. Mm -hmm. um, so, Scotty, can you, can you tell us about yourself? Tell us where you, uh, where you grew up, uh, mm -hmm. what, your, what your family life was like, and, okay. um, and then kind of what got you into music, like what, and what drew you? What what you know? What drew you about music? Well, I guess first um, I'm born and raised in Atlanta. Born in 1964, October 27th. So I'm 55. But the key to me getting into music was my mother. You know, my mother played piano and she sang. She was she was a great soprano. She was always singing in the choirs. But she studied piano and organ. Her mother, my grandmother, actually studied studied. I found this out later. Studied at the uh, Cincinnati Conservatory of Music for a little bit. My grandmother did on piano and organ. So my mom's side of the family were the artistic ones. My uncle, my mother's uncle was a great artist. He did about 50 paintings and he happened to be a jazz connoisseur, which I found out just before, a few years before he died. So he and I bonded like that, you know, because I was the only other jazz connoisseur in my family. And, uh, but my mother being in the choir every Sunday at Ebenezer, I grew up in Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, you know, with under Daddy King, Dr. King Sr. And uh, Dr. King Jr. was killed when I was four, but. My mom grew up with him, and I grew up with kids because we're all the same age. But the thing was is that Daddy King uh, had, we had four choirs at Ebenezer, and they would rotate every Sunday. One choir was called the uh, Church Choir, which was, uh, my mom was in that. They did Handel and Bach and used a big pipe organ and all that kind of thing. There was a male chorus, and then there was a children's choir, and then that was um, what is called the ML King Choir, and it's still there today. And this choir, the, the average age was probably 50 and 60 and above, you know? And they used, they didn't use the big pipe organ in the uh, choir stands. They used the Hammond B3 that was on the floor of the sanctuary. And uh, and every Sunday when they were there, when they would sing, whenever it was turn, their turn to sing, I'll, it was always my favorite because I was so mesmerized by the organist. His name was James C. Jones. I never forget that, man. He, he would be walking those bass lines with his left foot like a, like a jazz bass line, you know? And the chords were different, and just the sound of it was different. So when I heard Basie, not long after that, when I was eight or nine years old, 
I immediately identified with it because I said, oh, that's the same thing I hear in church every Sunday. That was my first indication. Oh, that's the same thing I hear in church. It's just more sophisticated. So that's how I got into jazz and Basie and everything. And then when I was about 12, I, heard, I, saw, I saw Basie for the first time live in Atlanta at a high school there. And then I saw them again when I was 17, uh, live at the, at the Fox Theater in Atlanta. And uh, when I was there, uh, after the concert was over, I was waiting on my parents to pick me up, you know, and uh, so I'm standing across the street from the theater. And I'm just standing there, you know, looking at the car lights, trying to, you know, find my parent, our car. And I noticed the silhouette of all of these guys with instrument cases crossing the street under the, at the red light. And I said, damn, that's the, that's the, those are the, that's the Basie Orchestra, you know? And next thing I know, they're walking towards me, man. Everybody's, I'm like, wow, they had on their brown three-piece, tailor-made band suits. They had the Freddie Green with the guitar and Grover Mitchell, all these cats, Danny Turner, Bobby Plater. And I remember uh, Sonny Cohn, the trumpeter, and I'm because I remember he taking a trumpet solo, so I memorized his face. And when he got up close to me, I said, well, hey, how you doing, sir? And I must have said, I play trumpet or something. Because the next thing I know, he says, come on in, sir, I have dinner with me, man. Come on, come on, have it, sir. Okay. You know, because my parents are looking for me. So we go inside and the thing was, I was standing right in front of the entrance to their hotel. I didn't know that's why I was standing. I'm just thinking I'm on a sidewalk looking for my parents, but I was right in front of their hotel. That's why they were going back into after the gig. So I sat down with Sonny Cohn, man, and I remember feeling, not only just look, watching him and looking at him, but I could feel the depth of what he was about. Meaning he was a veteran jazz musician. He'd been around the world a couple hundred times. He was in an incredibly important orchestra. He was an incredibly important part of the orchestra. I could feel all of that, man. And he was telling me things like, well, you know, just make sure you're practicing out of the right books and blah, 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 blah. And by that time, you know, I was in all state and had, I, just, I told him all that kind of stuff. He says, well, it sounds like you got the horn covered, but just keep working, keep working. And, and we're going to check out in the morning at about 10. We got to go to, I think he said Nashville or something. So why don't you come back in the morning and meet Basie, meet Mr. Basie? I said, okay. He said, yeah, bring your horn and bring your, your books or whatever. Just bring it, come back and meet me at 930 and I'll see you and I'll introduce you to Basie. So I went back the next morning. My mom took me down there, man. And, and I, the whole band was outside in the courtyard of the hotel. Everybody, Dennis Wilson, Grover, Bill Hughes, Danny Turner, Bobby Plater, John Williams, I mean, Cleve Eaton on the big, everybody, man. So I sat on a table, it was a little outdoor table. It was me, Freddie Green, Eric Dixon, and Sonny Cohn sitting at this table. And I remember Freddie, he was looking through my little awards book with my little Allstate medals and stuff. He was looking at my photos and Sonny was playing with my trumpet, man. And I knew right then, this is June, 1982. And I knew right then and there, one day I was going to be in the orchestra. I just knew it. I absolutely knew it. I, and, and I was calm about it. I wasn't nervous about it. Oh, man, let me keep calling this cat. And, you know, I just knew. There's a few things in this life that I just knew. That was one of them. And a month after that, because that was a big part of my, uh, what was setting the foundation for what I do today. A month after that, I saw Winton in London. Now, I'd seen him on television a couple months before on The Tonight Show. And it just, you know, blew my mind because when I saw that, I said, that's what I'm supposed to be doing. I knew I was going to play trumpet and music somehow, but I didn't know how or what, you know. But when I saw him, I said, oh, okay, that's it. I knew that's what it was. So I was on this thing called Jazz Abroad, which they don't have anymore. It was like a, a collection of high school and college musicians. They put together this couple, Lynn and Joan King, they're in Arizona now, but they would put together, select high school and college musicians from around the country, put them together in a big band and a jazz choir and take them to Europe for like three weeks and just tour the festivals and all that. So I, I got chosen to do that. And we were in London one night. We had a night off in London and somebody said, there's somebody playing, somebody named Winston Marsalis or who is that? So I said, oh, that's, that's the cat Winton. Let's go see him. So he was at Ronnie Scott's. So man, I got a table right up front, man, because I knew this was going to be a, a life changing moment. Sure enough, man, he walks in, man. As soon as he walks in, people clapping. And it was like it was a superstar or something, man, you know? And he walks right up to me. <laughs> you see, because there's only a few brothers in the place. i just be honest with you. There's only a few black guys in the place. So he writes, walks right up to me and says, hey, man, man, I got the greatest drummer in the world. That's the first thing I ever heard him say. He was talking about Jeff Watts, you mm -hmm. know? And then for the next three, four hours, man, I'm sitting three feet right in front of his bell. And that just completely, not only opened my eyes and my ears, but it changed my life to a point to where I knew that was what I was supposed to be doing with my life, being a jazz trumpet player. I just knew. So I had that connection with Winton and I had the Basie thing together. And that's exactly how my life has been. You know, I've been in the Basie Orchestra for 27 years now, the last seven as leader. But before that, I was on the road with Marcus Roberts, who was Winton's pianist for three years, well, six years actually. 
So I was on the road with Marcus. I did three albums with him, and we used to play all of Winton's music, Black Coats, all of that stuff, man. And when me and Winton met that night in 1982, we've been close buddies ever since then. So that's been almost 40 years now. And we've recorded together, and I had to do a, a, couple, a sub a couple times at Lincoln Center when somebody could make it. He called me to do that. So we, so my life and my career have been centered around me meshing together the big band concept with Basie and the small band, you know, small group thing. And I love doing both equally well. There's challenges to both. And uh, right before Frank Foster called me to join the band, I was on a, you know, trying to get a, a solo deal like a lot of young cats at that time had a manager. And I was opening for Dave Brubeck, opening for Ellis Marsalis at these festivals, man. And, and then the orchestra called and I said, well, I can't say no, you know, because Basie was all my, always my favorite. I had all the records, I studied all of the, all that stuff. So I put my solo career on hold and join the orchestra and that's been 27 years now. So I'm trying to get, I've done a solo record since then, but I'm still trying to get that kind of, trying to find the time to weave that back into what I do. And uh, of course, education is a main part of what I like to do. So I've been teaching at Florida State now for 18 years, you know, and I'm um, tenured there. So I love doing that. I'm part-time, which allows me to still travel and tour everywhere. And uh, I'm finishing up a revised and updated version of my book, The World of Jazz Trumpet, which is still the only one of its kind that came out it was published in 2005 by Hal Leonard. And I interviewed 21 of the you know, jazz pioneers that were still alive. Claude Terry, uh, um, Freddie Hubbard, Winton, Ted Curse and Maynard Ferguson, Chuck Mangione, uh, Bobby Shue, Joe Wilder, all these people. But we only used 15 interviews for that first book. And uh, so now I've been I, over the last few years, I knew I needed to update it. So I'm almost done with the updated version and the updated version will have 50 interviews. I've already mm -hmm. done 45. I got Fattis, Arturo, Doc Service, and Chris Bode, Wallace Roney, Terrence Blanchard, Nicholas Payton, Tom Harrell, Ingrid Jensen, you name it, man. And so combined with all the other interviews I did before, it'll be the real source for, um, for jazz trumpet, you know, the whole history of it, you know, how, and the history of the music to me has to be told with the history of America. So I have intertwined the history yeah. of America, along with the music, so you can get a better and a broader view of really what happened. But those interviews are uh, are just gold. I have all of them taped. I got them stored in a couple of places that are for safekeeping. And to me, that's the most important part of the book, because it comes directly from the mouths of the people who, who played and made the music. Clark Terry and the Freddies and the Sweets Edisons. And I interviewed uh, Arvel Shaw, who was Louis Armstrong's bass player, because that was the closest I could get to Armstrong. So I asked him questions almost as if I were if I were talking to Armstrong, him, Armstrong himself, you know. And uh, so that's kind of what I've been up to, you know. And uh, right now we're on a little uh, pause from this COVID thing with our touring. So the last three months of our touring have got canceled. Some stuff has been rescheduled. So it's like a wait and see with everyone else when we get when we're gonna get back on the road and resume. And in the meantime, I'm just trying to finish up this book and hopefully be done by the summer and uh, have the new version out next year sometime. So, um, when did you start playing trumpet, and who were some of your early teachers? Well, man, you know, it's funny. I started playing trumpet when I was nine, but I actually, it was by accident. I asked my parents for a violin. You know, at that time in the Atlanta public school system, or DeKalb County public school system, which is part of Atlanta, when you get to fifth grade, we're talking 1974, they say, you know, teachers always say at that time of year, well, if anybody wants to be in a band, you just take this permission slip home, give it to your parents, say, have them sign it, and have them get whatever instrument you want to play. And when you come back with that instrument, whatever it is, we'll place you where that needs to be. So if it's a violin, we'll put you in the string. On some of if it's a trumpet, we'll put you in the brass, whatever. So I asked my parents for a violin, man. And to this day, I don't know why, I think I saw another student with one. He said, yeah, we'll get you a violin, no problem, you know. So I remember the day, um, I couldn't wait to get home from school because I knew my mom was going to get that violin and I was going to be in the band. So I get home and she comes home in the car, man, and, and she gets to the trunk. She opens the trunk and I see this black Yamaha case on it. They said the black case that had Yamaha on it. I didn't know, you know. And I opened it up and it was a silver trumpet, man. And it was a beautiful fall day and the sun hit it. Bam! And I hadn't thought about a violin since, and I've been playing trumpet for 46 years now. <laughs> that's how long it's been. <laughs> and so that's how that happened, you know? And then uh, my parents had a lot of music around the house. My dad had um, eight tracks of Al Hurt. Uh, I remember hearing they had an Ellington album. They had some Willie Bobo. So I grew up hearing all of this stuff. And then one night, uh, a family friend of ours, close family friend of ours, is congressman John Lewis. 
and he he joined Ebenezer back. He and his wife Lillian joined our church back in the late '60s, and the two of them and my parents really bonded. So one night, they had, my parents said, uh, "Me and John, uh, me and your dad, and John and Lillian, we want to go out to a dance or something. Can you go to John's house, their house, and babysit their son, Miles?" I'm like, "You know, like, what am I gonna do with a son? Like, you know, I don't, well, I don't babysit. You know." So no, 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 just go. You know, just do this. I said, "Okay." So we get over to John Lewis's house. And he's telling me everything, you know, for emergency, do this, call this, whatever. And the main thing that caught my eye was the stereo system. It had these big, huge speakers that were hanging in the wall, a big stack of albums and everything, stereo equipment. Man, so I couldn't wait for them to leave because I wanted to hear some music. So when they left, I go over to the stereo system, and there was a stack of albums this high, man. And the top album that was on the top was a Freddie Hubbard album. It was an mm. album called Bundle of Joy. It was a red cover. And I just had it framed, as a matter of fact. The original that I had had Freddie sign and I had it framed, but the trumpet is wrapped in red cellophane, and I knew it was a trumpet, and I saw Freddie Hubbard, and I said, what is that? I mean, I put it on the album, I put the thing on the turntable, put the needle down, man, and that sound of Freddie Hubbard came through those speakers, man, my life was, it just meant, I couldn't believe I was listening to a trumpet player. I couldn't believe somebody was playing that clean, with that big of a sound, that smooth, and all of that. And I just wore that record out, man. And so Freddie Hubbard's sound for me was my first real sound that I absorbed as a trumpet player trying to sound like that. You know, it wasn't bebop, it wasn't straight ahead. It was 1978, 79, it's kind of thunk. But the way he was still playing bebop on it, you know. So I started, yeah, so I started learning his solos, man. I And I got so good at doing it that my high school principal, I think my band director told my high school principal, he should put me in some talent shows playing with that album. <laughs> so they would put me in these talent shows, man. And I have they have stereo. I put Freddie Hubbard's on my album on, and I stand on stage and play with the solos. That's, they had me doing that. Yeah, I was like, okay, all right. So Freddie, and you know, right around that time, Freddie became one of my biggest influence on trumpet. So I got started getting all of his records, trying to learn his stuff. And then I got the Basie thing happening too. I'm listening to all the Basie stuff, and then Winton comes along. So that's how all of that sort of wrapped around. My, my understanding of what great music could be. And then I got a scholarship to study at Florida a and here in Tallahassee. And my instructor there, Lindsey Sargent, he just basically presented the music to me in such a way that it's here if you really want to be serious and, and, and deal with it. He already knew I could play a little bit, I mean, just technically. But he said, man, you got to know about Blue Mitchell. You got to know about Nat Allen. You got to know about, and Nat, you know, he were great friends because he and Cannibal went to school here. And he said, Nat comes through here every three or four months. I'm going to introduce you to him. And, and he did that, and I, I ended up meeting that alley man. And of course, I, I knew Winton. I was talking to him all the time, and that's kind of how all of this stuff sort of started happening. And when I finally got serious, serious meaning daily practice, not just jiving all the time, but daily. Okay, what am I going to work on today? What tune am I going to learn today? Or what scale am I going to learn today? I didn't get into that until I was about 18, maybe, like my freshman year in school. And then it was just a matter of, you know trying to get better, being on gigs and stuff. And that's kind of how that happened. Yeah. You know, you, you said, uh, so you, you said your birthday is what? October, October 27th? 27th. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm October 17th. Oh, okay. That's the day before winter and a few days before uh, dizzy. Um, and, and, uh, you said, uh, 64. Yeah. I'm 74. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So we're just about right on ten years. All right. Ten years cool, apart. Man. I knew I liked you. Um, <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> Feeling good, <you>, brother. <laughs> so, okay. So, so you talked about some of these sort of highlight moments that really steered you towards. Okay, this is what I'm going to do with my life, mm-hmm. and it seems like music sort of um insisted upon you yeah in a way you know um yeah i could say that i've you know, actually, I'm, I'm, go ahead no go ahead go ahead no actually you just made me think of something like that one night and this is how i knew music i was supposed to be a musician one night i'm in my room man i'm i don't know what grade i'm in you know ninth tenth probably right around in there and i couldn't sleep you know it's like one or two o'clock in the morning i gotta go to school the next morning but i can't sleep and we had just gotten this, um, I'm sure some of the youngsters don't even know what this is, but a, 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 a collection of encyclopedias, like in, Encyclopedia Britannica, whatever they were. 
and they were really pretty. They were in my bedroom. They were all white with red, you know, trim. They were just beautiful. Look to be looking to look at on the shelf. And I couldn't sleep this night, man. I'm like, I don't want to feel. I don't really feel like listening. To nothing. So those encyclopedias caught the corner of my eye. I said, hmm. And something instinctively said, go over and get the one that has M on it, and just look up the word music. And I pulled it out. This is one or two in the morning. Turn the light on. Turn the M, and it said music. And man, as I started reading about music and just the origins of it and what it was, I felt a fire and a passion in me that I had mm. never felt before, man. just from simply reading about music. And I couldn't get enough of it. Then from that point on to the day, that's how I really understood then that, uh, like Picasso, somebody asked Picasso one time, why did he choose to be an artist? He said, I didn't choose art, art chose me. The same thing here. I didn't say I want to be a musician. I want to go play the trumpet. These things happen. My mother coming home with the trumpet instead of the violin. I mean, what? How can how you how you predict that? You know. And then I'm sitting here and I'm reading, just literally reading words, and it felt like music to me. It felt like I, I could hear things in my mind. You know. And uh, and growing up in the environment that I grew up in, every and Daddy King too was such a a, a, a great person. Other than being just a minister and the father of Dr. King, every four or five months or so, he would have a world-class musician give a concert at the church, man. It would be like a world, world-renowned soprano, a cla- and it was all classical stuff too, no jazz or anything like that, but like a world-renowned soprano, like after church, you go back and hear the concert, or a world-renowned pianist or organist or something. So I grew up hearing great music every week at church, whether it be my mom's choir, the ML King choir with the gospel, or the male chorus, or the children's choir that I was in at one point. So music was just one of those things where um, I never had to question what I was doing. I never had to question, hey, should I major in music? Never had to, no, man, that's, that's what I'm supposed to be doing, you know? Yeah, I, I, had, a, I had a similar experience with, with music. Um, I, started, I started playing when I was really young. My dad was a great saxophone player. Mm-hmm. I heard him playing around the house, and so... Um, actually the first instrument I got a sound out of was actually a trumpet. Hmm. Um, okay. and that was when I was around two. Wow. Two. <laughs> that, hey, I, I don't remember any of this. That explains a lot. So, <laughs> <though>. that explains <laughs> a lot. <laughs> and then, uh, I started playing saxophone when I was six, which is actually too young, really, especially hmm. to play woodwind instrument because your teeth are too soft and all that. Oh, and I ended okay. up getting braces and stuff because of that. But, um, from the first notes that I played on the instrument, that's mm. all I wanted to do. Ah. And uh, my dad tells me that um, he was, he didn't want me to be some kind of weirdo, you know, uh, you know, kid that just stays in the closet, you sure. know, all day. Cause that's what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. So he tried to make sure that I had some balance with yeah. some other activities and things. And he would kind of limit the amount that he would allow me to practice. Mm-hmm. But I got a, uh, I had a lesson three or four times a week, mm. um, and uh, and he he had a particular, he had a really focused, you know, particular thing that he wanted to be me wanted me to be working on. Yeah. In particular, he um, didn't want me to think of it as practicing, but mm. as playing. Mm. Okay. And so he tried to control the way that he would talk about the music so Mm -hmm. it never seemed like um of course there was lots of times you know especially you know you get older and i always tell my students it's rare that i actually want to practice Mm -hmm. i Mm -hmm. I practice a lot yeah but it's not you know it's not something that i you know wake up in the morning like i can't wait to to go practice it's just it's just something that i know if i don't do it Mm-hmm. then there's a lot of stuff that I'm not going to be able to, to get <laughs> exactly to. Exactly right. That's a great way to put that. Exactly right. Yeah. And, um, uh, but, but I always, I, I, but I, I, I never wanted to do anything else but music. Yeah. It's, it's the only yeah. thing I ever really wanted to do. Yeah. Um, and I would be utterly miserable mm-hmm. if mm-hmm. I tried to do anything else. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, no, you know what? I think, when I, I I played Little League Baseball, I was uh, in my neighborhood. We all played. Matter of fact, my next door neighbor, he got drafted by the Braves, Atlanta Braves. Man, we were serious in my neighborhood playing. So I was playing from 
the age of about 10 or 11 till about 12 or 13. And I was really good at it. I had always, I had a, always had a high batting average and that kind of thing. And, you know, we always just took it so seriously. But all of a sudden, one day, I had no, I mean, zero interest in baseball anymore. And then I remembered, man, you know, my, my trumpet is under my little sister's bed. Something, I mean, because I had, I don't know why I kept it under her bed. And I remember going out of my sister's room and I looked under the bed. Sure enough, there it was. I pulled it out and opened the case and I saw it and I just had this thing with it. I just had this, okay, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. With no more baseball, I'm supposed to be doing this. Yeah. And I just proceeded to try to get good at it, you know? And the trumpet also, I have to say, and this, I don't know how this sounds, but it was never difficult. Never, ever to this day, never has been difficult to do whatever I wanted to do on it. Luckily, I had a great teacher too, but even from the first day that I played, the very first song I ever played was um, Mary Had a Little Lamb. And my brother showed it to me because he played trumpet a little bit too. And he had it, you know, and we would look, because I just got it and it was brand new. He said, oh, let me see it, man. He picked it up and he played. And he played uh, Mary Had a Little Lamb. He gave it back to me. And I just played it right back to him. I didn't say, well, what are the notes? What are the, I just, so it's always been, sort of an easy thing for me to do, um, which is also basically, I have to say that when something is like that to me, it makes me more patient to learn more. I'm not in a hurry. I'm not in such a, oh, I got to do everything at one time. It allowed me to just kind of be patient, take my time and develop different levels of my proficiency on the instrument, which I'm still doing. I'm, I'm not done not done with that, but mm -hmm. it's always been a joy to play. Nobody ever had to I see. Yeah. tell me to go play. My band director, my parents, they never had to say, you, you got to, no, you know, nobody ever to tell me. And so I guess that's, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. That's part of why you're doing what you're doing. Nobody had to tell them. Yeah, my dad told me, um, I, inter I interviewed him actually for this okay. same interview series. Because mm -hmm. there's a lot of, you, you have a quite vivid memory mm -hmm. of a lot of things that were going on uh, first experiences with things that kind of really turned you on and thing. Mm -hmm. My memory is, uh, is, is a lot more cloudy. Mm -hmm. Um, and part of the reason, um, is might be because of what age I was when I started playing. Mm -hmm. Um, but I just don't have vivid memories of certain, a certain sort of cr critical thing. So, um, so part of the reason why I interviewed him mm -hmm. was to, kind of get some of those those sure. details and fill fill some of that stuff in mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh but he wait a minute i lost my train of thought um he helped you to get clear on what's on some things you couldn't remember yeah let's see i totally lost that but that's okay mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> <That's all right. laughs> but one thing about my uh, one thing about my dad was that he, it was really important that he get me around musicians that could really play, mm -hmm. you know, uh, people that were uh, very experienced. And since I grew up in Eaton Rapids, Michigan, where there weren't many of the kind of musicians that, you know, I'd want to yeah. play with, mm -hmm. um, uh, we, uh, we ended up connecting with Marcus Belgrave and oh, yeah. Rodney Whitaker and and uh, and all these Detroit musicians. So mm -hmm. I ended up spending a lot of time in Detroit, mm -hmm. hanging out with Detroit musicians, playing yeah. with Detroit musicians, mm -hmm. recording with them. Mm -hmm. I played in that uh, uh, Roy Brooks and the Artistic Truth okay. band, which was kind of a Detroit sort of local Detroit version of um, art. Art Blakey and the Jazz okay. Messengers, okay. Um, and like James Carter was in that band, Rodney Whitaker, mm. um, Vincent Chandler, mm. uh, Dwight Adams. I mean, okay. the, you know, long list. Um, uh, J.D. Allen, okay. you know, long list of of uh, notable uh, Detroit uh, musicians. Mm. So, who who were some of the uh, the musicians that you played with when you were coming up um, you had these experiences where you got to hear someone yeah. um, uh, or interact with some musicians but who were you playing with the first cast that I really started playing with were when I was in school so my instructor my instructor Lindsay Sargent uh, he was you know a head of jazz studies at, at uh, Florida A&M and he's head of the music department there now but great pianist man hell of an arranger 
So he had a quintet or quartet with um, the saxophonists that used to be that founded the program at FSU. Uh, Bill Kennedy, who's still around, he's he's retired now. So Bill and Lindsay had a group that they co-led together, and they basically would have their students fill up the rest of the band. So they had me on trumpet, a cat named Tim Fox on bass, and I forgot who else they had on the, on the drums. One of the front, one, one of the students there. So that was my first real consistent. Uh, group that I've ever that I ever like played with all like weekly. We had a gig somewhere every week, whether it be a club or wedding reception or something. So he was basically Lindsay was getting me to play standards. I'm learning all these new tunes. I'm trying to play, you know, trying to figure out the chord, you know, scale relationship. I'm trying to do all of that while I'm on the gig, you know. So mm-hmm. that was the first real group that I played with, and the, and the reason that that is significant is because. We played this one club in here in town called Andrews Upstairs once a month. We had one weekend a month that we would play. And after about six or seven months straight of that, the owner comes up to me after a gig one night. He comes straight to me and says, hey, would you like to bring your own band in here? I said, really? He said, yeah. I've been watching you. You know, you show up on time and you sound good. You dress nice and all that. And I said, okay. And so what happened was I knew that that was, that was a pivotal moment. Because then I can get the, my own cast that I wanted to play with me. And what I did was I asked Lindsay, man, my, I asked my instructor, would he be my pianist in my group? And he said, yeah. Now, how many times would an instructor flip that script like that and become a side man to his student where the student is calling the shot? Yeah. That's exactly what he did. But that was a beautiful thing because this cat and I, we're like this, man. And he used to give me the key to his office so I could go up to his office on the weekends and I had access to his grand piano. Oh. He had 2,000 albums, stereo system, and my trumpet. That's all I needed. And so when I started taking over the gig for on my own, I started. I understood at that time I needed to program things so I could learn how to play. Like, okay, the music of Cole Porter, we'll do that this week. The music of John Coltrane that we could play, we do that this week or next month. The music of Joe Bean. So I started getting so excited because I could plan each one of these little gigs that we have, or once a month anyway and have it structured so way, okay, I, I'm having trouble playing in the key of A. What tunes are in that key? Let me, let's play that. Or I'm having trouble playing at a certain tempo. Let's work on playing these tunes this week. So that was a, that was the best thing that happened. And Wycliffe Gordon came along right around that time when he had got to school. And all of us were in a group together. And we would just do gigs at happy hour at hotels, man. We would do, we were always playing. And we actually got the reputation. We got Cats on the on FAMU's campus, at least in the music building, started calling us the Gig Boys, because it was me and Wycliffe, Herb Harris on tenor. I don't know if you know heard heard, heard of Herb Harris. He was with me and Marcus Roberts' group. He's on that Tough Tennis record. With Todd Williams. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah. So he and I were roommate. He he was at FAMU too. He was roommates with me. And so we had this great group together, man. And then Marcus Roberts called, and that was when I, that was when I really went to the next step, as far as having to be accountable <laughs> for what I was playing. Because you know, unless you really know what you're doing, you know, you can you can be sound you can think you sound great and you can be missing changes, you can be doing all that. So Marcus's group was like the Blakey of its time for us anyway. Because we he would make sure like if we're playing a standard man, you gotta know every you gotta know every change, man. You gotta know every chord. You can't be up there just playing. So working with him, I began to understand this music required a certain level of of thinking. And engagement that there was no just no way of getting around if you really wanted to know how to play. I mean, you can get up and call tunes and just play all you want, but are the, is it really structured to what you're doing? And he was coming out of Winton's band, you know, for six years. So Winton, you know, didn't tolerate anything less than excellent some music musicians either. So Marcus was the same way because none of us had had a name. We couldn't really play. So he's taking this these young musicians under his wing, and he had a recording contract with Novus that he had just gotten. And next thing I know, we at his house rehearsing every day for like seven or eight hours a day, man. The next thing I know, he says, well, we get we get ready to go on tour. It's like, on tour? I was so excited, man. I, I would have done it for free because I just wanted to play. I wanted to learn how to play, you know? And so when I'm on the road with him in 89, 89 uh, we did a tour. We were playing all over the, the States. And and in one important engagement that, helped, that happened, we opened up for the Milk Jackson Quartet. So it was Milk Jackson on vibes, uh, Tony Dumas on bass, who was subbing for Ray Brown, Billy Higgins on drums, and Cedar Walton on piano. And we were out at Kimball's East or West, out in Emeryville, California, near Oakland, for seven nights or six nights or full week. And we opened up for them for like the first set. And then when the show was over after that set, we all walked across the street to Denny's, me, Milk Jackson, Billy Higgins, 
Cedar Walton, Chris Thomas, the cat, our bass player, Maurice Carnes on drums, Marcus, and we would get the same booth in the back, and we would sit there and just listen to these cats talk, man. Mm. That was a huge understanding of how jazz musicians really cared for one another, how they were looking out for us, how they understood that what we were about to inherit was deeply serious. It was deeply mm. serious, man, and we couldn't take it lightly, and we didn't take it lightly, you know? And so every time I look back at photos, I, I remember taking photos of that gig a lot of the times, man, when I look back at those photos, that was like I was going to school every night, going to a university every night, you know, because they would critique what they heard us doing. And we just sat back and we saw the love, we saw the brotherhood, we saw the excitement in their eyes of us that there are some, uh, some serious young brothers that are trying to play. So that also helped my love of wanting to make sure I just got it right, man. So when I'm at the microphone, do I have it right? Do I know what I'm doing? You know, and it's still like that <laughs> and change, but so it's just been this, I've had a great opportunity along my journey to run into the right people at the right time. And, uh, and then of course, over the years, I became friends with Freddie Hubbard, uh, Nat Adderley, of course, uh, played with Dizzy once, um, John Faddis, and just these great musicians, man, uh, that, I learned from Sweets Ellis and Clark Terry, you know, and uh, I just took everything I've ever heard them say and tried to understand it. And then when I joined Basie, I mean, I'm listening to Frank Foster every night, man, every night, man, what this cat was playing. I mean, he recorded with Monk in the 50s, you know, wrote all that stuff for Basie. And every night I'm listening to him warm up. I'm listening to him, just his arrangements, man, Kenny Hing and Danny Turner. And I remember Danny Turner told me one night he was playing a gig with either Machito or somebody in New York in the 60s. And John Coltrane came up to him after the game and said, hey, man, what was that you played on, the, on that tune you played? What was that? And he, was, he showed John Coltrane something. So he's telling me this stuff. And I'm like, wow, man. All of this. So I've been uh, just a res. I've just been trying to get all of this information in from anybody. That's why I believe in, you know, I don't believe in putting any, music, any musician down, man. I might not like the music they're playing, but that doesn't give me the right to speak, you know, put, put them down or speak condescending about them. Every artist, and I think especially every jazz musician has something to say, you know, whether we want to hear it or not, they have something to say. And I want to hear what that is, because I know at some point, if I understand it, then I can add it to what I'm trying to do. So anyway, that's kind of long answer to it. You know, yeah. <laughs> no, no, this is great. This is great. Um, so the, the term uh, uh, musical, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, I don't like such and such because it, it's just not musical. Oh, yeah. You know, I have found that that's a that's a way that folks can sort of throw shade on something that mm -hmm. they themselves either don't understand and they exactly. themselves couldn't play that way themselves. Right? Exactly. It's as simple as that. It's not that that is just a flat truth. Ain't nowhere. It's nowhere around that. You can't sugarcoat it. That's exactly what it is. You know, I remember. <laughs> I remember, man, it took me two years to hear Ornette, Ornette Coleman. Like, I bought The Shape of Jazz to come. You know, I've had the, record, had the record a long time. And I could never, like, what are these cats doing? But I kept that to myself. You know, because I said, man, it, he's obviously important. I'm just not smart enough to get it yet. Or my ears aren't developed enough to really hear it. And, man, when I joined the orchestra, this is, again, in 93, I had my headphones on. I used to walk, carry around a little portable CD player. And I listened to that recording on every tour, man, for two years, man. Two years. And finally, one day we'll be driving from the hotel to the gig and I did my routine. I went through a bunch of other stuff and I said, let me put this back on. I put it back on. And as we're putting into the to the gig, I finally got it. I actually heard it. Oh, that's what they're doing. That's where he, oh, okay, I, I got it. I got it. Two years it took me to do that. And this is, and I'm a musician. So some people, um, you know, when it comes to putting shade on other people or just not or saying things negative, man, or like about somebody's sound, or I mean, man, look, I, you know, I don't have time for all that. I just know <laughs> I'm just trying to, everybody is a human being. Everybody is trying to do the best they, that they can. And I think we all do better when we just, you know, if you don't have anything nice to say, then just, just zip it, man. And just, 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 nobody needs to hear that. Just, just zip it. But that's just the nature of human beings. Human beings always have to do something to kind of, you know, throw shade on somebody's success or, you know, say something negative about them to make them look human or whatever it may be, you know? 
And uh, but when it comes to jazz, man, I just think a lot of that could be jealousy. It could be uh, you know, the lack of ability. I mean, I've seen teachers get jealous of students. I've seen that. You know, I've seen cats that you know that got a great gig, and the other guy was jealous because he thought he should have gotten that gig. You know, so life is it is what it is. But throwing shade on people, man, I just wish cats wouldn't do that. I just wish just just appreciate it. Just check it out. Uh, speaking of uh, teachers and students, mm -hmm. um, you you uh, you come across to me as being a very generous, mm -hmm. generous with information, generous person. And one of the ways I know that to be the case is that um, uh, we were on tour, and mm -hmm. you played this warm up. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a regular warm up, so it's a very wide range. Oh yeah, warm up. Mm -hmm. And I asked you about it, mm -hmm. and then you send me a PDF. Yeah. <laughs> it had the it had it on it, yeah, and yeah. um, and I must say that um, uh, I've not always had that experience with folks mm -hmm. that I've that I've uh, paid paid them a compliment by asking, because wow. it's a compliment. If I ask, if I ask, uh, no, I'm not toot my own horn. Yeah, sorry for the pun. I get it. But I can hear mm -hmm. and I can play. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, it would help me out if someone would just show something to me. Yeah. But I can figure it out what's going on. And really what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to start a conversation. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to pay compliment. I'm trying to say, man, that's really killing. Mm -hmm. And it's so killing that I'm going to ask you about it. Mm -hmm. You know, and... Um, and so uh, it's not always the experience that someone is generous uh, with the information and say, hey, yeah, you can have it. You know, if I have it, you, you, it's yours, too. Um, I've had experiences with folks where I would say and this in a couple of these experiences was when I was a student mm -hmm. and it was a guest artist that was coming in and I asked them a couple questions about something that they were doing. Mm -hmm. And they would just, I say, hey, you know, that one thing that you're doing, you know, can you show me what that is? What, what is that? And they would just keep playing it faster and faster instead wow. of like, I mean, this is like a guest artist that got paid to come in yeah. at, a, at a, you know, at an institution where the students and that's the primary reason why yeah, they even exactly. got the gig exactly right. and they're still not willing to share the information, you know? Man, you know, I, I hate to hear that, man. And I just have to say that, you know, I've always been uh, willing to give because I've been recipient of a lot of great information from Clark, from Sleets, from Freddie, to Matt Adderley, to Diz when I hung with him, to, you know, all these musicians I've been around, Frank Foss, to Kenny Hing. I remember one time I, I'm on the bass office, we were on the road, and I think there was a piano in our dressing room, and I'm sitting at the piano, and I'm trying to play night and day. So Kenny Hing comes behind me. He said, no, man, that first chord is not right. I said, what you talking about? I said, it's not that. He said, no. So he reached over me. He said, this is the first chord. I said, ah. He said, the first chord is A flat major seven. It's not D hat diminished. He said, jazz musicians just came along and just started messing up, you know, changing and tritone subs and all this kind of thing. But the right chord is actually A flat major seven. So the fact that mm -hmm. he did that was so, so freely and openly he wanted to make sure I was getting the right information, you know? And so for me, man, like one of the things I did for my students at FSU is that I put together 23, so, so far, 23 CDs, and each CD has about 12 to 13 or 14 trumpet solos on it of the most important trumpet solos ever recorded. So they have about 330 or 40 trumpet solos. Almost everybody from, I mean, everybody you can think of. And like, for example, disc, ele disc 11 through 15, each track is a blues, man. Each track is a blues, so you can hear Dizzy playing a blues, Wenton playing a blues, Chet Baker, my, whomever. Because I knew that was something I had to give to the students because they didn't grow up in an era with albums where you can go to a record store and go through the albums and get the right stuff. They just have Spotify. They don't know what's out there until they search for something, right? So I yeah, said, oh, yeah. man, I got to put together a library for these guys and women that you know would be as comprehensive, even more so than I had when I was growing up. So for me, being generous, I don't think about it that way. I just know that there's information that if, if I know that somebody needs to have it, I'll offer it or just give it to them or put it in a situation where they can grab it. And believe it or not, not all students, we uh, don't even have all of the CDs. You know, mm -hmm. like I always give them a, uh, surprise quizzes 
on like I, they're coming to my office for a lesson. I say, okay, we're gonna do a listening exam. That's it's a quiz, and I'll play like track ten from disc five and see if they can figure. I give them fifteen twenty seconds. They don't know. I'll go do another track, disc nineteen, track three. You know, so giving. I think jazz musicians have a responsibility. It's not. It's not something that we have to. We should even have to think about. All jazz musicians have gotten information from one source or another, whether it been directly or even from a record. Even if you're just getting it from a record, you're getting something from somebody. So why 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 don't you want to pass that on? Or why why did you want why did you want to guard your little phrase so much or whatever it is that you you making it difficult somebody that's you know trying to play your compliment that wants to play it. Right, right. So you know I just can't I can't imagine Dizzy being that way. I can't imagine Miles being that way. Winton is not that way. None, none of the cats that I know. I can't imagine the elders or Basie even being like, oh, can you imagine Basie? You go to ask him, can you show me the plink, plink, plink? And he just does. He does that. <laughs> it's one of those notes. Yeah, it's one of those. Oh, yeah, find, find that. It's, it's in there. He would do that. Man. He would he would, he would oh. the piano and say, the top note is the root, the bottom note is the sixth, the middle note is the fourth, and you move up to the fifth. He would show that to you. And to right. me, that is what we have a responsibility to do. All of us do who play this music because we've all been recipients of information. You know, but I think sometimes the the, the personalities or the makeup of a person can allow the the I don't know, whatever, can allow something to prevent them from doing that. I just hope I never ever ever end up like that. I just can't imagine. That. I wanna whatever I have, you wanna see you know, something I'm playing, you wanna okay, here you go. Here you go, man. Young lady, whatever it is. You know, I think something that um, so it's it's like a, I mean, it's a known thing that artists can be very insecure. Yeah. Um, and some of us are more insecure than others, but uh, being a musician, uh, being a performing musician, someone that's on the stage and uh, is either being applauded or maybe not applauded as much as someone else was mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. it's easy to start to get in your own head mm -hmm. uh, about certain things mm -hmm. and uh, I think the uh, I, I think that if we're always learning and always open to new information it's like the principle of a vacuum mm -hmm. you know um, you can't get anything in if you're not giving anything out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that also, if you're not giving and getting anything in, you may be less likely to want to give something out. Um, something that uh, uh, seems to be true about you is you're always into new stuff. You, you're always digging. You're always... You're, I mean, it's it's like uh, it's like you're a kid in the candy store. Every time, <laughs> every time we talk, you're talking about some some other angle on something that you yeah. that you are discovering. Yeah, and I, I just, you know, man, I just, it's like when I started researching my book, and the way that started was an accident. And I always use this use the story to give you know kind of as to to your point. But I was on the road with Marcus Roberts. We were giving a concert at Georgia State, and they asked each one of us in the band to give a master class. And so I had to give a trumpet master class. So doing a master class, and I play, talk about Lewis, the whole lineage of the instrument, and I play a Louis Armstrong solo, whether it be West End Blues or Blues in the South. I actually play it, and I learn. Then I play Dizzy Gillespie solo on Mike Tamiji from Jazz at Massey Hall. Then maybe Miles' solo on, you know, uh, Straight No Chaser or Clifford Brown solo. Anyway, I play these solos all the way up to Winton, and Winton's solo would be uh, either Soon, Soon I Will Know or something from one of his Standard Time albums. So anyway, and as I was playing these solos, People, they could hear how the lineage changed. And so then this one kid asked me a question and after I had doing the Q&A, he said, man, and he said, all this information is great that you're giving us, but is it written down anywhere? Because after each person that I talked about, I would tell a story if I had a personal one that I could tell. And with Diz, I did have one I could tell. Freddie Hubbard, I had one I could tell. Nat, so I knew a lot of these guys, right? And he said, is any of that information written down anywhere? I said, you know, I come to think of it, but no, it's not written down anywhere. You know, it's not, not how I'm presenting it. And so that was the first little thing in my mind. I said, well, maybe that's something I can do. Maybe I can figure out how to do that. And I didn't do anything about it for six or seven months. It just, I wasn't even thinking about it. 
all of a sudden one night here in town, same same place, apartment complex I'm living now, but in a different apartment. I I woke up one night and said, oh man, let me see if I can do something about this book. You know, try to write, try to get this information out here because I knew it would help me. Most most of all, just researching, it was going to help me to get better and learn about all these people. So I grabbed a yellow pad and a pencil and I started writing down names of trumpet players just to see who I knew off the top, how many I could write down. I'm just writing, writing, you know, Dizzy, Freddie, Chet, Clifford, you know, the main people. And when I was done, I had 75 names. And that's a lot of names, you know, that's a lot of names. But when I was done researching my book, man, 1,200 names I had of just trumpet players, man. Mm -hmm. It's because once I found one person, oh, man, well, who do they play with? And then I, it just kept leading me to all these different bands. Then I just started saying, okay, anybody who played jazz trumpet, whether they were played third, fourth, fifth, in some section, never took a solo, never got a recording on contract, I needed to know them too. Not all the, the mm-hmm. guys, women, everybody that, that was stars and got all of the publicity and got all the contracts and airplay. I need to know those other people who were support players too. So that is what led me to the about 1,200 players. It's a little bit more than that now even. So that's how I started writing this book because I just knew I was trying to be, I just wanted to be thorough. I just wanted to learn why Dizzy played how he played. Why did Roy play the way that he played? Why did, you know, Arthur Briggs play the way that he played? Or why did Don Goldie, who people don't even know about that much, why, how did he play so well with that much technique and you don't even know his name hardly, you know? So being thorough is what it was all about with me and just trying to get better as a musician. I'm still doing it. I'm still, I just, I just ordered a CD the other day of somebody I hadn't heard of. Um, I can't even think of the guy's name now, but I came across it and I immediately went to iTunes and I found it and I just ordered it, you know? And uh, because I know I want to make sure when I'm finished with this updated version of this book, I haven't left anyone out by the time it comes to print. I don't want to leave anyone out. And it's just a matter of just trying to be thorough and learn, man. I'm still trying to learn, you know? You know, I'm hearing you speak now, and every time I've heard you speak, and it's the same when you're in front of the band. Uh, you're very, uh, you're very, you're a very fine presenter. Thank like you, you're, you're. Uh, but the more I hear you talk, um, the more I realize that what you're doing in front of the band on stage to the audience is really very natural. I mean, it's, it's, uh, I mean, you have certain things that you say, Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, uh, it doesn't sound any different than, (laughs) than how we've been talking in this interview. Now, is that something, now, is that something that you have, have you worked on that? Is that something that you've, okay. No, I just, you know, first of all, I like to write and I love to read. Mm -hmm. So... I guess the fact that I like to write and I'm a stickler for like spelling and things like that. So I guess when I'm speaking, I just try to just try to be me. I just try to, I've never rehearsed anything. Only thing I've ever rehearsed was Japanese because <laughs> in Japan, I wanted to say my <laughs> in Japanese. I wanted to make sure I had the, right, had the phonetics right. But as far as speaking in front of the band, as long as I know what my subject matter is, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with, you know, uh, just speaking freely and kind of off the cuff, that kind of thing. But it's just something that, um, it's gotten easier over the years. I just have always been, actually, since I was in college, though, I was always kind of put in a position of being a spokesman. Like when I was in the marching band at FAMU, you know, I was voted, you know, freshman of the year, sophomore of the year. You got to get speeches for that stuff. And I was in my fraternity. I was like one of the spokesmen for that. So, you know, even when I joined Basie, man, they made me the orchestra spokesman. So anytime somebody needed to go do an interview, they would tell me to go, can you go do this interview on the radio? Can you go, you know, I would, so it just became a, I guess I was just a natural at it, and um, and you know that's just kind of what happened with that. So I just try to when I'm speaking to the audience, I try to make them feel welcome. I don't try to I try to make it feel as if the whole room is just one orchestra or one band. I don't look at it as us. We're on the stage, and I'm speaking to these people in the audience who paid their money to come see us. I'm trying to include them in the whole vibe of the thing, which is why sometimes I'll make a joke with somebody or. Or, uh, or say something that's you know you know funny or whatever it may be. I'm just trying to you know let them feel, let them know that we appreciate them being there, and uh, because we wouldn't be there if they weren't, you know. Yeah. So speaking for me, it's just I, I don't know. I guess it's always been natural. I guess you know. Um, I was thinking about your trumpet. Now, something that you might not know mm-hmm. about me. 
Uh oh. <laughs> No, I'm not going to play anything. I'm just going to pose. But uh, (laughs) so here, here's my story about the trumpet. Um, So this is a French Besson. Yeah. And uh, I got this horn from Dwight Adams. Wow. Okay. And this was his horn for a long time. But uh, but Dwight is kind of like one of these guys that he's always got a different horn. Like every time Mm -hmm. I play with him, and we play quite often. He's got a different horn, you sure. know, or he's trying out a different mouthpiece or something. Sure. So I think he was about ready to, you know, to change to something else. Mm-hmm. And he's got, you know, he's got kids and mm-hmm. I've got a six-year-old. Okay. And uh, my six-year-old, he's got a, it's uh, it's over there. It's a P trumpet, that blue trumpet right yeah, there. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so uh, I made a deal with Dwight mm-hmm. uh, to trade uh, lessons. So, uh, first we had to come up with instruments. Mm-hmm. So we traded instruments. I had an extra saxophone. I gave that to him. He mm-hmm. gave me this trumpet. Okay. And then we were supposed to do like Skype lessons or something. Okay. Uh, now this is during the time I was, uh, I was still working on my doctorate. Okay. So, so needless to say, uh, we still haven't gotten together for any, <laughs> any <laughs> Skype lessons. Okay. Uh, but now that that is over, uh, my, um, and my intention is to is to get a little more serious about yeah. the instrument. So I will be, uh, you know, e- emailing you and texting yeah. you, yeah, man. you know, as uh, absolutely as I get to it. Now I used to play trumpet when I was a kid, okay, uh, but it was just totally, I, it was nothing formal, and I, I don't even. I mean, I I learned how to play some tunes, yeah, uh, but um, I'm not even sure I knew what the notes that I were playing, <laughs> yeah, was, yeah. you know? I hear you. Um, and, uh, so anyhow, that's something I want to do, but I was going to ask you about your horn. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So right it here. seems, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So you have a lot of extra metal on your horn, like the, uh, the, uh, this, you know, the, yeah, the yeah Dave Monette, this horn here is about, was made for me about 10, 12 years ago, but Dave Monette came mm-hmm. along and started redesigning trumpets in the early eighties. And these braces here, you can see these, they are to keep the vibrations centered in the horn. So that's for it. example, if this were thinner, mm-hmm. that's gonna be less uh, less room for the sound to kind of marinate, so to speak, in one area, if that makes any sense. Yeah. He figured out a way to try to, to try to connect the horn a little bit more, which is why the mouthpiece is made the way it's made. Each mouthpiece, this comes out, is, is, is made of a sp- uh, specific weight. If I were to take the mouthpiece out, the horn would tilt a little bit that way, just because of the weight of the, of the way it's made. So yeah. he figured out the weight of the mouthpiece for this horn needs to be a certain way. So when, I, when you put the mouthpiece in, then it goes like that. So the weight is distributed to, to here. So to me, it's not heavy. And uh, But he just figured out, he just came along and redesigned like how the slide is bent. By bending mm-hmm. the slide a certain way on most trumpets, when you get about right here, it almost goes down straight in a line. Almost. Right, right, right. Yeah. But the way he figured out this is that by bending it in that particular with that particular degree, it uh-huh. speeds up the airflow. And by speeding up the airflow, that makes you have to have less effort on your part as a player. I see. So when the air goes faster, then that's less effort on this part, which means you just have to relax a little bit more and just play as if you're breathing. So, for example, when I when he had my first one, the first one I got was a gift from Winton. This was 1989. I was playing a box strad, and I was it was always out of tune. And we were just getting ready to go on the road with Marcus, man. And, and every time I would play, like with Herb Harris, my trumpet and tenor part, we playing these tunes that had close harmonies, you know, two mm-hmm. notes that were close like that or whatever. And if you're out of tune, it's hard to really even get in tune when you're a half step away. So. So I was on the phone with Wycliffe Gordon. He was at Winter's house that night for some reason. They were talking, and I was telling Wycliffe about it. I said, man, we get ready to go in a road, man, this horn is killing me. So next thing I know, Winton's on the phone. He said, hey, man, I heard you're having trouble with your horn. I said, yeah, man, this thing is blah, 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 blah. Next day, FedEx, I had a Monet. The next day, this cat FedEx to me one of, his, one of his custom-made trumpets, man. And I remember opening my door and sitting on it. I'm like, what the heck is that? So when I started playing it, it was the first trumpet that I felt I could feel like my low, like the partials in the upper register, like above, like when you get to high C, as you go higher on most trumpets, those partials, they get closer together. It's easy to miss up there. Well, on these trumpets, with Dave's trumpets, the partials are further apart. So when I'm playing like a high C or a high D or high E, it almost feels like I'm playing in the middle register. 
Man. That's what makes it so – because in the way that he got to that, he just simply was building the horn more in tune. His whole thing is about constant pitch center. So when I play a low C, a middle C, a high C, they're all in tune. They're not uh, like, you know, flat and lower register or sharp and flat in the upper register as most of them trumpets are, which means – which meant was after I was playing Winston's for a year and I had a different mouthpiece and I had a Jordan Ellie mouthpiece in it. And I, you know, I was with the orchestra and Dave saw me. He's like, no, man, you gotta, I gotta build your mouthpiece because that's not the right mouthpiece. It's not working right. You can play it, but it's not working right. So finally we got to the point where he said, I just need to build you a horn. I have to build you a horn. I said, well, you know, I, he said, don't worry about it. He built me this trumpet man and my life hadn't been the same since. That's, not, that's since 1994. And this is my fourth one. And it's built around my body buoyancy, my oral cavity. And the way he test plays them is that um, he'll give me the horn, he'll stand about 30, 40 feet back and just ask me to play something. It could be anything, but I have to repeat it. Like if I play F major scale, he'll say, okay, play that, play it again. And as I'm playing, he hears how the air is coming out through the valve casing. It's this deep, man, <laughs> I'm telling you. He can hear how it's coming out and he can say, okay, I need to adjust that. He'd come back, he'd grab the mouthpiece or the tuning slide with his tool, he'd make a little adjustment. And pretty soon I could feel the pitch just doing, just, just locking in, lock, more lock, more lock, and then bam, pretty soon it's locked. So no matter what note I play, no matter what volume I play, the note is there. It's in tune if I play. So this cat, man, is just... It, so sounds all, like it, 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 it sounds like he has perfect pitch or something. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. David, and Dave began as a trumpet player. He's a trumpet player. And he just got tired of playing inferior equipment. And nobody had made any advancements in the building of a trumpet. Like in, up until Dave came along around 1980, all trumpets up until that point were built the same way. And although they could have been better, they were just built the same way because everybody thought that that was, was fine. So anyway, long story short, Dave came along and with the help of Adolph Herseth and Maynard Ferguson and Winton and Art Farmer, all these great players, they would give him feedback, Winton being the main one, and they just convinced him to go ahead and build a trumpet because at first he was only making a lead pipe. He was making this, this part here. He was just building this part. And this is probably the most important part of the trumpet anyway. And so as he was building that, even my private teacher had a king trumpet, but he had a Monet lead pipe on it. I remember that from when I was ninth or 10th grade. And so the word got to Severson, the story goes, and Doc Severson calls Dave up one day and said, hey, I hear you make trumpets play better. And Dave said, uh, yeah, I'm working on it. Dave said, next thing, Doc said, well, I need you to come to Beverly Hills and fix my horns. Dave was on a plane the next day, man. Flew, Doc flew him out from Chicago to Beverly Hills. And Dave, it's a funny story too, because Dave said, next thing you know, he's in Doc Severance's living room, man. Doc Severance is the most you know, popular trumpet player in the world. He's on TV every night, right? Okay. And so Dave said, Doc had four or five horns on the table. And he said, okay, I want you to, I'm gonna play and just tell me what you think. So Doc started playing, you know, how Doc plays, beautiful, loud, fast, whatever. And so as he's playing, <laughs> Dave said, and he's thinking to himself, but he's telling me this, he said, man, he's like, I'm gonna have to lie to this cat. I'm gonna just have to tell him the truth. I'm gonna have to, you know. So Doc played, he put the horns down, and so Doc said, okay, well, what do you think? Dave said, at that point, I had to make a decision. Lie to him and tell him he sounds great or tell him the truth and just risk being kicked out of his house. He said, man, you sound like shit. Sorry. Your tone is all nasally. It's all stuck up. You're out of tune. You know, he just went down a list. He sounded like a pet shop on fire. He just, just named everything. And so when he was finished, he was thinking, he, well, that was going to be it. He was going to go home. Doc, 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 Doc grabbed his checkbook, wrote him a check for 15 grand and said, here, fix it. That was the seed money for Dave's, for Dave's company. Man. And Dave could go back, he could, he could, he could uh, patiently begin to figure out how to get these, all these things better. So then Winton comes along, you got a master at jazz and classical, who knows a better trumpet, who knows trumpet better than that, right? right, right. So he starts building and work with all these cats, man, and classical cats, jazz cats, and, that's how I got into it, and that's how I experienced it. So every trumpet that he's made for me, this is my fourth, they get better and better and easier to play. Easier to play. And when I first got my first one that he built for me, we were on tour. It was the Basie Orchestra, Lionel Hampton's Orchestra, and the Ellington Orchestra led by Mercer Ellington. And this is 94, and I got the horn on the road, got to the hotel, man, I was so excited to get to the gig, I'm warming up, everything's okay. And the first tune we played was Corner Pocket. And when I first came in, when we first came in with the brass, on my normal part where I come in, I could feel my sound just jump out over the whole band. I was like, oh my God, wait a minute. I had to, I had to, I had to bring it back, right? And so then the next day, it was like I couldn't play nothing. I'm like, man, what the hell? What the hell happened? Something get stuck in it? 
I couldn't play my slur. It was like, it was just off, man. But the next day, it was like back. I'm like, okay, I'm, ooh, oh, I'm glad everything is cool. Then the next day, it was back time. I'm like, what the hell is wrong? So I called Dave on the phone. I mean, we were like in Boston. I said, hey, man, I don't know what's up with this horn. This horn is not happening. It's just not a, one day it's cool, the next day it's not, the next day. And so you know what Dave said? <laughs> he, said he said, it ain't the horn. <laughs> it ain't the horn. He said, what you are doing, and you don't, and this is the problem with tournament players, you just don't realize you're doing this. You are using your old muscle memory to play a trumpet that's not built to be played that way. I used to have to lift things up, lift things down, use alternate frame. I don't have to do any of that on this, man. All I have to mm. do is play straight and just let the air do the work. But I was doing all of my muscle things that I wasn't even conscious of. He said, man, just relax, play real soft. And if you, do the, if you breathe the right way and just don't try to manhandle everything, and just let the horn do the work for you, you'll be fine. Sure enough, I, I did exactly what you said the next day, and till this day, it's been the easiest thing in the world to play. Because I had to just let go of all this other stuff that I had learned over the years to compensate for, for instrument instruments that were inferior. So, we so, what you're, so what you're telling me is I need to get me a Monet. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, but, okay. you can, but you can use the concept of how he works with his players, because he teaches yoga also. And okay, so basically, yeah. if you if you can get to the point to where, that's how you're sitting right there now, how you feel. You're just sitting at rest and you're just kind of hanging out. That's how I should feel when you play. I see. That's exactly how I should feel. So that when I'm sitting here now at rest, when I put the horn in my mouth, I'm just now pressing valves and holding something. I'm not all of a sudden huffing and puffing and trying to, no, no, no. That's what I was doing when I first got it. I'm trying to play loud and, no, man. I, I had to figure out that great little sweet spot. And once I found it, I had never experienced anything like that in my life. The sound was bigger. It was easier to play, less effort on my part. I'm never tired when I play in the afternoon. I can play two or three hours. I'm never tired, man, because I'm, I'm not overdoing it that, in ways that I have to, that I used to have to when I was playing my Bach or my, I had a Yamaha. I, was, I never had to. I never, so that's why everybody now is trying to copy what his horns look like. But what they're doing, they're going about it the wrong way. Dave builds horns from the inside out. You don't care what this looks like. That's just the result of what he figured out, a best way to make yeah. it make it better. So now you got companies that are copying all of the stuff and they have no idea what they're doing because they're just copying from a visual standpoint. They don't know why that's built that way, why he's doing this, man. And each horn is built for an individual. Every trumpet he, ba he makes is built for an, a very specific individual. Like when I play Winton's, I pick his, like when I go to the shop in Portland, uh, Winton gets like a new one like every year. He'll build him a new one and take the other one back and he'll, you know, sell it or whatever, but some of them are at the shop, man, every once in a while I want to marry, I pick one up and just go play it, and I can't play it. It goes sharp on me, man, what the hell is, and I have to realize, oh, that's made for him, man, that's not made for me. I could adjust to it, you know, but we don't have the same body buoyancy, we don't have the same oral cavity, yeah. we don't have the same bone density, and so he's just figured out, Dave has figured out a way to, to bring all of these things into one little thing, man, and just it's just, I just wish every trumpet player could feel what I feel when I'm playing. You know, it's just... it, it's interesting. Um, you know, I play guitar, mm -hmm. and and uh, uh, one of my guitars is quite a bit. It looks quite a bit different mm -hmm. than the other ones, and so mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, this ha it has eight strings, but that's yeah, that's yeah. not wow. the point. But there's a few things. So it's got a these uh, multi-scale or fan frets wow. which is much more natural because when you do this closer to your body there's mm -hmm. a natural fanning that happens oh. as opposed to playing a guitar where you have to do like this oh. which is totally unnatural right oh, yeah. okay. um uh, the body of this is chambered to make it really light mm -hmm. even the placement of where the strap strap goes on to the instrument yeah um uh the fact that it's a headless design mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. tuners are down here which oh. reduces the weight oh, okay. the neck is unusual it's asymmetrical there's a flat spot that changes position as it goes down wow. right? okay. uh, so there's all these uh innovations on this on this instrument mm -hmm. and uh, uh the name of the guy is uh strandberg okay Str and uh, so 
he started doing this and then a lot of other companies started copying it and so their instruments will have some of them will have a very similar look Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but they don't play like that guitar exactly 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 right i know i know man exactly exactly right yeah dave there's one company that he actually had to um, he had to tell his lawyers to tell the guy to cease and desist man because he was flat out just copying you know, and so some again, Dave's main thing is just trying to make the player, uh, make the instrument better, so that it makes the life of the player easier and even longer as a player. Mm-hmm. And again, the way I feel when I'm playing a ballad or if I'm playing an open plunger solo, or whatever it is, man, everything is there. All I have to do is relax and play. I got to warm up and practice still, you know, mm-hmm. but just relax and play. Just don't overdo it. So Terrence Blanchard, or Winton, I mean, and it was funny, man. Nowadays. It's been so much, so much. We talked. We were talking about shade earlier. It's been so much of that at uh, at people that play Dave's instruments. It's just, it's just unbelievable that I've that I've seen that I've heard. You know, some of it is a joke. It's kind of funny, but a lot of it has to do with flat out jealousy too, because they're, they're very expensive. He doesn't make them for everybody. You're not on a. You don't go to a music store and look at ten of them and choose one and go home. He has to know you before he builds a trumpet for you. And so um, it is what it is. And you know, I said. Same, same thing about, you know, when it comes to Dave, you don't have to play him on that, but just try to, what he what he's talking about when it comes to breathing and just try to make your life easier as a trumpet player, just, you can try that. You don't have to, everybody doesn't have to have one of his instruments. But if you can get one, the more power to you, if you can. And you, he would, you know, if, if somebody wants, to, wants an instrument, they call him up and talk to, talk to him like everybody else. And as a trumpet player, it'll change your life, I can tell you that. That's without a fact. I mean, I can't even... Like I just can't even I just can't even imagine playing something else. I just can't because it, it'll the notes will be smaller. I'd have to work harder, you know. And I just I, I'm glad those days for me are over. So I, I have two two more things I want to talk to you about. Um, one of them is about what you practice. Mm-hmm. So um, you know all of us. The longer you've been playing, the more you're practicing is likely to change, Mm -hmm. you know. Um, So in particular, my question is not is not aimed at what is good advice for for a student. Okay. my my question is specifically about what are you working on right now and what is your approach to trying to access things that are in your head that you have yet to realize well that's a very good question man that's a deep question too um i guess what i've always been working on and what i work on every time i play i'm just trying to be clear as to what i'm doing so if i'm playing a standard for example that has say if i'm doing you know of course all the things you are you know if i do a so if i'm playing that tune when I begin the solo and after I played the melody, I'm just trying to play clear. So I'm trying to get that same sound of those chords here. That's all I'm doing, too. Mm. simply trying to be clear now that solo i just played there was just i want to know to take it that but you know what i'm saying i'm just trying to be yeah. trying to be clear so when i'm playing with the big band or if i'm playing with my small group now small group some of the things i write i write a lot of stuff with phrygian chords and basically what i've worked on the most is that i made a i made a like a little pack with myself maybe 25 years ago or so 30 years ago that whatever tune I could play on the trumpet, I needed to be able to play it on the piano. And I mean, be able to be able to play all the chords, walk a bass line through it, all 12 keys, everything. So if it's giant step. So whatever tune I'm working on, I ask myself that question, can I play it on the piano? Can I play it on my horn too? So that's really what I've been working on for the last several years is to really, really make sure that I'm thorough, that's all. 
And then another thing I work on is like, if you take a tune, I work on reharmonization of tunes. So if you take a tune like, um, uh, here's that rainy day, right? That's basically what that is, those chords. You know, you got here, and then you got here, and then you got here, and then here. But you could do something different from that. You can do this. So I just went. I'm working on always trying to figure out a way to make whatever I'm playing as clear as a bell, meaning the harmonic roadmap of it. I know exactly what's going on or what's there, but I also can see on the left of it. This is how my mind works. I can see to the left of it what direction I might want to go, and I can see to the right of it if I want to go the other way. And so then the key becomes you got to play with musicians who think like that. So if, you, if I'm playing with a pianist and he doesn't know that he can go, and every time we play that beginning of that tune, he just go, he or she, he just keep doing this. After a while, it's, it's nothing much. I, what can you do with that if they keep repeating the thing, same thing over and over and over and over and over? So I'm always trying to find a way to uh, make my harmonic roadmap clear. That's really all it is for me. So even if I'm playing corner pocket with the band, if I'm playing whatever I'm playing, I'm trying to play in such a way that I can hear and I can see the roadmap clearly. So if I want to alter it left or right or up or down, I can go that way. And that my playing is clear enough that if, I'm, if, if the pianist can, can hear me and the bassist and the guitarist, they can follow me, then now we're making music, especially with a small group because you got that freedom, right? Yeah. So when I'm playing with my small group, I tell them all the time, man, if I'm going, let's just, Let's, I like to do I like to do at least one or two songs on a gig, even concerts where it's not rehearsed. It's just not rehearsed. Period. We know we, we know we're gonna play it. Like I did a thing at the University of Michigan not long ago, and they, they had you know a trio with me, and uh, I said, man, so we planned the program and everything we we're gonna play. But I said, look, let's just have these two tunes here. I'm gonna call one of them on the gig. We don't need to rehearse it. We, 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 whatever happens, it's gonna happen. I'm not gonna call the key, and that way our reflexes, whatever happens can be natural. And of course, one of the best tunes of the night was the one that we didn't rehearse. It was the one because everybody had to put all ears on. They had to really, really, really listen to what we were doing. Nothing was pre-settled. Nothing was worked out. You just have to go with, the, with, with what's happening. And as a matter of fact, the tune was, uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, I didn't tell them what it was until I announced it to the audience. Mm -hmm. I said, now we're going to play All Of Us Here to Stay. So I don't know what went through that mind as soon as they heard that, but all I know is I just I just start, I just started playing, right? And luckily they knew the tune. And for me, even if they hadn't known the tune, they've heard enough of it to figure it out by the second or third chorus. And to me, I have no problem with that. That's just that's just having fun with something. You're not trying to destroy it. You're trying to get it, you're trying to really learn it as you go along. And so that keeps that spirit of spontaneity that's inherent in the music that you don't find in too many other musics, you know? So right. again, I'm just trying to always work on stuff and play in such a way that I'm crystal clear as to as to what it is I'm playing. Crystal, 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 crystal clear. So if you were to walk by um, a room and hear me practicing or playing with a band, without knowing what the band is playing, by what I'm playing, you should be able to tell if it's a standard or not. Oh, that's I Remember April. Oh, that's Night and Day. Or that's Giant Steps. Or that's you know, recording me, whatever it may be. So that's the kind of stuff I work on, man. And I just, I love chords. I love experimenting with different ways to play them. Um, but I made it a point to make sure that I could play piano and take a solo on and comp on every tune that I know. So if we took giant steps and I just had somebody, we had a jam session and the piano player is tired or has to leave, I could comp. And I love comping more than I love solo. Because comping is how, you, to me, is how you really learn because that's based on your reflexes. You're reacting to something, and you got to be oh, able. To, right, right, right. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And so that's the kind of stuff I work on. Uh, of course, technical stuff on the trumpet. I still work out of my Charlier method book, A2 book. That's exercise I gave you. I still work on that, so I can keep just my technique together. And but from a jazz standpoint, I'm trying to learn more standards. And one of the things that I also work on, I like to take um, major classical pieces and rearrange the re. I mean, reharmonize the melody, like Sonata Pathétique by Beethoven. <laughs> <laughs> you know, 
know, so I take yeah, man. Yeah, man. So I like to take melodies that are very strong, and see if I can reharmonize them, and write a lead sheet and give it to a band. We can I can play that as a ballad, you know, with a, with a quintet or something. So that what that does for me that that challenges my ability to uh, take pre-existing harmonic material and just enrich it. Oscar Peterson would do that a lot. I mean, that's what all jazz musicians do anyway. But I try to, the reason I use popular songs because I know that song so well that if I didn't do it the right way, it would sound, it would just be messed up, you know what I mean? So I'm working on the same thing with uh, this one here. I'm working on this. You know, the, so I mean, Moonlight Sonata. So that first chord is C-sharp minor. So I can play that chord a lot of ways. So I'm working on that too, so I get to a point where I can play that. But that's kind of what I'm working on, you know, most of the time. Very cool, man. And, um... So, one thing that we have in common, mm -hmm. and I didn't know it right off, it took a little bit of time for me to discover this, is we both love Family Guy. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, yes, sir. That's my Stewie's, my <laughs> man, Stewie Griffin. Ooh, look out. Yeah, man. <laughs> Yeah, and I remember show, man. Yeah, when man. I when uh, when I learned that, then yeah. I I I texted you a few <laughs> That's right, you did. You did. clips uh, right. of things because I think when we when I first discovered that you you were into that, yeah. you hadn't you hadn't like seen them all yet. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so I, I was giving you little a couple little <laughs> bread breadcrumbs. Yeah. I have never laughed so hard in my life at anything, man. And I grew up on Sanford and Son and, and all of that stuff, man. But Family Guy, when I figured out what was happening, because I did, I slept on it for like the first eight or nine years. I've never watched, you know. And one night, I said, let me just watch this, man. And I was on the floor, man, when I started picking, you know, figuring out the personalities and who was. And, and what was funny, Seth MacFarlane, he sang with us at the Hollywood Bowl about four or five years ago. It was a tribute to Frank Sinatra, and I remember seeing it on the schedule. I was like, "Oh man, I got, I can't wait to meet this cat!" Right? And so mm -hmm. we went, we were in L.A. and we get to the rehearsal. I, I'm like a kid in the candy store because Seth MacFarlane is about. I'm like literally a kid. I can't wait to meet this guy, man. So they introduced, you know, they walk over and said, "This is the leader of the bass circus, Scotty." And he said, "Hey, man, how you doing? I said, Look, man, forget all this jazz stuff, man. I'm your biggest fan. Forget all this. I love Family Guy." He was like, "What?" <laughs> he said, "I said, yeah, man. You have no idea, man." He said, man, if I'd have known that, I would have bought you some merchandise. I would have bought you some stuff, you know? Yeah. But man, that show is just, it's like a great, it's like a great jazz band or something. You know what I'm saying? It's like yeah. the characters all work together and mm -hmm. any one of them can carry an entire episode just by themselves. Yeah. And that's the same thing with a great jazz band, man. You listen to Miles' great band, any one of those cats in that band, they could take that over for the night if they wanted. But they work so anyway. Yeah, man. We but that's something we definitely got in common. This family guy, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's funny that that uh, that cartoon is so intricate. Yeah. Wow. Um, I think uh, maybe the folks don't that don't know about it yet, or they mm -hmm. they see one episode or part of an episode. Yeah. It, it might just seem like a show that's about you know. Uh, yeah, dog and a baby or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. It, or or just like you know, bodily human, you exactly. know, bodily functions. You know, yeah, yeah. It might <laughs> think it's something yeah. like that, yeah. uh, like toilet ah. human or something. But it's ah. it's so much deeper than that. Yeah. And one thing I I dig about that cartoon is the great music, mm, the great yeah. music. Yeah, Every episode, yeah. <laughs> and then they have all of these uh, uh, sort of uh, musicals. Yeah, that's uh, right. they'll break <laughs> they'll break out into a musical, and it's yeah. heavy stuff. Yeah, I mean, the music is point. killing. Killing man, and you know the story. You know, a buddy of mine plays in an orchestra. Iron mm. Eagle, a great trombone player. He's in that orchestra at Fox, and you know the story. It was pop, uh, a major story. At one point, Fox Studios, the executives, went to Seth and said, "Look, man, we got you got a ninety piece orchestra. Well, we don't need it. You know, shows a hit. We don't need all that anymore. We need to scale it down to like 15, 20 people or something, man." And he said, if you do that, I'm walking. If you make me fire all these great musicians, what that that has made this a success, I'm walking. And he held their feet to the fire and they caved in. And that's why those musicians are still working because of what Seth did 
that stood up to those uh, executives in Hollywood, man. They were gonna just just can all that and have it be synthesizers and what I mean. And Ira Deepas told me that because he's in the orchestra. And yeah. So, so that's just a great show, music, everything. You're right. Um, and of course, he's got he's. There was a couple other sort of. Uh, well, one of them is not a spinoff. One of them was a spinoff. That was uh, what, what was the the Cleveland, Cleveland show? Yeah, Cleveland show was a spinoff. American Dad. But American Dad. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you, you check that I'll one watch, out. I don't watch it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Family Guy is my favorite. Yeah. Uh, yeah. American Dad is a little. Uh, it's 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 a little more aggressive. Mm-hmm. You know, so I think it's harder for people to probably yeah. get into. But uh, yeah, so anyhow, we we have that family guy, family guy connection, and uh, uh, I just thought that was. I mean, it's it's nice to. I mean, obviously we have music in common, yeah. so that's you know that's that's the big thing. But it's always nice to to find out some of those those kind of in, inside baseball kind of stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, man, I remember one time we were, we were leaving, this is like when I first joined the band my first year, and Danny Turner was on lead, and Danny was like in his mid-70s, and of course we had Foss there, and we were getting ready to leave the hotel to go somewhere, and I think Danny was a little late getting on the bus, like only by a minute or two, you know, and so he, he, his seat was right across the aisle from mine, and as he got towards the seat, he said, man, God damn it, I hate him, I'm going to miss what happened on Golden and the Beautiful, or something, like one of the soap operas, he was, he was so into one of these soap operas, that it was playing that time of day when we had to leave. <laughs> and then he hated to come back. That's why he was late. He was like watching this so man, you know, people are human, you know? And when I found that out that people like just, you know, card, whatever they liked, it just made them even more human to me. And so for me, family guy, man, I'll talk, I'll talk about that with anybody. That show, I've never seen anything like it before or since. I, I, the writing, it's just yeah. so, Oh, it's just everything that you can put in the show. I just can't say it any other way. I mean, it, it's just so intricate. All, all of the effort, even for instance, in one of the cutaways, oh, all yeah. of the development <laughs> and <laughs> effort. You know, it, it's That's just right. it's a lot of discipline. I mean, yeah. I, when I watch that cartoon, there is a lot of discipline associated with, yeah. you know sticking with something just long enough for it to work yeah. and <laughs> yeah. just the well, stuff that, uh, yeah. it's just, it's just such, such a, a, a great cartoon. Yeah, it's like, again, it's like a great jazz band. Man. It's like a great, yep. all of the working chords are complimenting each other. Every episode is different, meaning every song or every concert is different. It's just, it just had all of these elements of just excellence, man. So that's why when I met Seth in person, I was just so excited to talk to the cat. I mean, and just to almost try to pick his brain. How did you? And I did tell him. I said, "How did you? How did you think of all of this stuff, man?" Mm. Well, I'm not a team of writers, and you know, we we toss stuff back and forth, man. And it's just, I've never seen a bad episode ever, no. ever, ever that didn't keep me interested from the beginning to the end. And that's saying, how many seasons? What seasons are they now? Sixteen or seventeen years? Or something? Yeah, it's like it's like that's, that. Yeah. It's been yeah. on for a while. Yeah. Okay, so so. Uh, you want to plug something? You want to talk about something that you're th- that's about to release, or uh, you you talked about the book that you're yeah. Uh, well, um, yeah, my the up, the revised and updated version of my book uh, it's called The World of Jazz Trumpet: The Comprehensive History and My Practical Philosophy. It was first published by Hal Leonard in 2005, but I've since read I've finished more research. I've interviewed more players. My interview total when I'm done will be 50. I've already done 45, so I just got Sean Jones, Ray Vega, Derek Gardner, Leroy Jones, and Tom Williams left, just those five left. And um, I hope to be done with that. You know, I had planned on be done with it this summer anyway, so now that we are inside with this quarantine thing, it really helps, actually. So I'll, so look for that early next year. And um, the Basie Orchestra, we have a, uh, a, a latest recording came out a week ago, Ella 100, live at the Apollo, it was for Ella's 100th birthday. Patty Austin is on that, Liz Wright, Cassandra Wilson, Monica Mancini, David Allen Greer. We have strings and it's killing. It's called Ella 100. That's out now. You can get that iTunes or Amazon. And then we're going to have our next recording coming out probably December or January, live at Birdland. We just were at Birdland this past January and uh, we recorded four nights in a row, both sets, everything. So I have enough material to put out actually two separate, two CD sets, volume one and volume two. So we'll have volume one come out because it'll be the 60th anniversary of the last time the orchestra recorded at Birdland, 1961. 
for 2021 will be 60 years. So we're shooting for that. And, uh, and everybody is featured, man. The cats are swinging. The crowds were packed every night. So that's just going to be great. I can't wait for that. We're going to try to get that mixing done this summer. And then the next recording we're going to do in the studio is going to be a blues recording. We've been planning, I've been planning that for the last year or so now, because last year, Mr. Basie was inducted into the Blues Hall of Fame in Memphis. That's and right, that's right. And, all that. and it dawned on me while I was there, I was like, man, we need to make a record with some of these cats out of here, you know? Because the band, the orchestra's never done anything like that. Like an authentic blues-based record with, I mean, mixing the blues with what we do, like Muddy Waters and Robert Johnson and Sun House and B.B. King mixed with the big, oh my God. So I've been playing that yeah. and uh, gotten the a OK um, on the budget to go for that. So we got to get that together. And then, um, you know, just teaching and still touring and the orchestra is still on the road when we get back to work. And hopefully we can get back to work, you know, and get back yeah. on tour. So that's you know, I'm, I'm realizing that we have something else in common. Mm -hmm. um, we're both... Uh, Part of the Hal Leonard family. Oh yeah, yeah. They published my book, and uh, I haven't talked to them in a long time. And I don't even know if they know I have another book coming out that I'm working on, doing an up updated version. But we'll be. I'll let my agent handle that when I'm done. I just want to finish it, and then yeah. get to my right. agent and see if it's Hal Leonard. Fine, if it's not, whomever. But I do know this: it needs to be in the right hands because this material that I've been able to amass, and it's taken me 15 years or so to put all this stuff together, man. To interview 50 pioneers, I mean, important trumpet players. That's a lot of people. Yeah. That's a lot of people, man. And to have all of that in one volume, I'm just not going to give it away. It's, it, it has to be presented right. And uh, so, you know, when I finish it, it'll just we'll just make that decision. But I just think that uh, people will, people will get a lot out of it. Because <laughs> one of the things that I did on the interviews, I asked the first four or five questions to everybody is specific to them. And then the last two or three, it's just a, a general question that I ask everybody just to hear the different answers from everybody, right? Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example, and I, I do a name recognition at, at the end. I say, uh, just, I just give you one example. So the name recognition, when I was with Doc Severson, I said, okay, um, A minor seven. And I said the same chord for everybody, but most, most of them. I said A minor seven. So Doc said, F sharp, okay? So when I got to Jimmy LaRocca, now, Jimmy LaRocca is the son of Nick LaRocca, who was in the original Dixieland jazz band, the first jazz band to record in 1917. His father was a cornetist in that band out of New Orleans, and Jimmy is in New Orleans. He's in his 80s, and I went to his house, spent a whole day with him. And when I asked him that same question, because he can play, man, great musician and all of that. So I said, okay, um, A minor seven. You know what he said? <laughs> <laughs> this cat said, I have no fucking idea, man. That's exactly, that's, that's what I'm talking about. That was, his, I don't know. So I got all of these different players a asking them the same kind of question. You know, I, I, I give a name recognition. I'd say to Doc Severance and I'd say, Wynton Marsalis, and he said, Supreme Commander. That's exactly what Doc said. Or if I say to John Faddis, Clifford Brown, he may say this or this kind of thing. Or if I say to Ingrid Jensen, you know, Tom Harrell, she would say that. So. I've been really, really excited about working on it, and I'm, I just got to finish these last interviews. But when it's done, man, I think it'll be something that uh, that everybody will get a lot of information out of, no matter if they play trumpet or not. You know, there's stories in there, it's photos that have never been seen before. But basically, we just I just wanted to make sure we documented, that I documented as much of the truth about the history of this music as at least pertain to trumpet players that I could get. So a hundred years from now, somebody wants to really understand about Jeff Trumpet, they can read this book and get it straight from the horse's mouth. Well, I asked Freddie Hubbard a question, for example, how did you learn how to play on chord changes so well? Because I knew that would be a question that a hundred years from now, 50 years from now, some student would want to know, well, damn, how can he play like that? And so I asked him, hey man, how did you learn how to play um, changes so well? And he said two words, piano, the piano or piano. So that meant, he said he went to the piano and you know he could make sure he could play his tunes on the piano. So every tune, again, like myself, that I can play on the piano, I'm going to make sure I can play here and whatever I can play here, I'm going to play there. Freddie just reinforced that for me, you know, and Miles was a great pianist. Dizzy was a great pianist. Anyway, on and on. So that's kind of where it is. Well, speaking of interviews, uh, thank you so much for your time. Oh, sure, man. For this interview and, uh, uh, 
you know, be safe. We'll, uh, pray for your family and uh, for our community, for our world, and pray that we get out of this thing quickly and so we can get back on the stage doing what we love in front of an audience. Yeah, man. Thank you for all you do, brother. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. You got it, man. Okay, Sean. God bless you. Same to you, baby. Take care now.